Uh, welcome everybody um, again. We have Ben with us from at Bible Outreach or Bible Outreach on YouTube. Uh, today we're going to discuss some common arguments against the deity of Christ using the biblical scripture, particularly the New Testament, uh, but not restricted to the New Testament. So uh, with that said, Ben's going to introduce some verses that are that can be used to support the argument that Christ is indeed God, as we already know. So a bit of a spoiler alert. Um, here comes the truth. All right, Ben, over to you. Yeah, you're right. And, and the reason why that is, is because when, as you and I and many other people, when we go to Speaker's Corner, the one thing people often do is they try to use the Bible to show Jesus isn't God, when the whole entire point of the Bible is to show Jesus is God. Yes. Um, one, one popular argument, Kay, is that um, when you have the, the, the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, John is, is accepted to be the last Gospel to be written. Mark is, is widely accepted to be the very first Gospel to be written. And the popular argument now from people like Shabir Ali and even atheists like Bart Ehrman, they, they argue that the, the Jesus you see in the Synoptic Gospels, in the Synoptic, uh, Matthew, Mark and Luke, he's shown just to be just a prophet, really. And it's only when you get to John's Gospel that we see Jesus having this kind of these divine attributes and being God and, and things like this. So at, for, for, the, for the moment, let's start in the earliest Gospel. Let's start in Mark, okay. uh, chapter 1, verses 2 to 3. And from the very get-go of Mark's Gospel, it's clear that Mark believes Jesus is God. So when people come to this argument, well, according to Mark, Jesus is only a prophet. If, I, I struggle to believe that people have actually studied Mark when they say things like that. Because from the very get-go of Mark, Mark says in chapter uh, 1, verses 1, this is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And then what he does, he quotes from Isaiah chapter 40 and Malachi verse three, verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 1. And he applies these to Jesus and to John the Baptist. Do you want to recap for anybody? Chapter... Do you want to recap for anybody who doesn't have an encyclopedic memory for verses? Yes. Do you want to tell us what he was quoting? Mark chapter one verses one to three. It says, "This is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God." As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, "Behold, I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. A voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord." make straight paths is him for him for what he's doing there he's referring back to isaiah 40 verse 3 but also malachi 3 1 because in uh, isaiah 40 verse 3 it says the voice of him and there's that same language there found in mark the voice of him who cries out prepare the way for the lord in the wilderness uh, notice the key words here make straight in the desert a highway for our god so in Isaiah 40, it's talking directly about God. Yeah. In Malachi 3, 1, you have that same language. I will send my messenger and he will prepare the way before me. This is God speaking. So when you have Mark there, he's clearly drawing back on, drawing yeah. to it from um, Isaiah 40, verse 3 in Malachi 3, 1, from the sinless to being John the Baptist and he's applying the Lord God who's had his way prepared for him uh, to, to Jesus. So from the very get-go of Mark's gospel, Mark is pointing to the divinity of Jesus as foretold in Isaiah, as foretold in Malachi. So when people say the Mark doesn't teach Jesus is God, it only teaches that he's a prophet, simply open up the, th the first three verses and it points directly to the deity of Christ. Right. You can, Mark continues in the very next chapter, in chapter uh, 2, verses 5 to 10, he talks about Jesus forgiving sins. Now, the Jews rightly um, ask Jesus, they rightly say among themselves, why is this man speaking like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Only yeah. God can forgive sins, which, yeah. they're right to say, which they are right to say, because only God, as we agree, can forgive sins. Now, if Jesus was just a good prophet or, or a messenger or whatever, he would have to have turned around and said, guys, you've misunderstood what I'm saying. I'm just a messenger. I'm not saying his sins are forgiven by me. I'm just saying that his sins are forgiven in a kind of, you know, um, because Generic. God forgives them. Yeah. Exactly. He didn't say that. He said, I say this so that you know I have the authority to forgive sins. Okay, who can forgive eternal life as well. Exactly that. Yeah. Okay, who, who can forgive sins? Who is the only one that can forgive sins? Uh, God. Exactly. Yeah. What does Jesus do here? He forgives sins. What's the conclusion? 
uh, he is God. Perfect. Exactly. And Hallelujah. I think, Mark from, I think Mark from the very get-go is, is, is drawing upon um, Isaiah 40 verse 3, Malachi pointing to the divinity of Christ. In yep. the very next chapter, he has Christ forgiving sins. Clearly Mark is pointing to Jesus being God. But yep. then we have in Mark chapter 9, not just the words of Mark, but the words of God. In Mark chapter 9 verse 2 to 7, it says this, and he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. For he did not know that they say, <coughs> excuse me, for he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. And a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice out of the cloud said, this is my beloved son, listen to him. Now, if Jesus is just a good prophet, yeah. what's God doing calling him his son? And if Mark isn't trying to portray Jesus as God, what's Mark doing putting these words in God's mouth? I, I think, think that I think the common uh, problem or misconception, or at least the perceived problem, is that um, Muslims and Christians alike um, are apt to use the word God when they mean the Father and mm -hmm. Father when they mean God in, in his entirety. So because of that interchangeability, you could also call, for Christians, you can call Jesus God, and um, to some extent you can call God Jesus, you can call the Spirit God. So when people say, and God called to him, and when he prayed to God, I think that's where the separation opens up in some people's minds, because they think, well, hold on, just linguistically, if you're talking to God, you are not God. Whereas if we say he spoke to the Father, or he spoke with the spirit or the spirit spoke to him or rested upon him. I think it clarifies for people um, just those points. I don't mean to say the Bible writers didn't consider them, but obviously they were written at a time when, uh, yeah, when mainly it was a Jewish audience they were speaking mm -hmm. to who already knew God as the father. Exactly. Yes. But um, yeah. So from the very get go of Mark's gospel, he's pointing to the divinity of Christ. He's pointing to, the divinity of Christ to Jesus forgives sins. He's pointing to the divinity of Christ when God himself calls Jesus his own son. Well, how can a prophet be God's son? If he's just a prophet, what's he doing? What's he, what's Mark doing calling him um, the God of the Old Testament in Isaiah 40 verse 3 and in Malachi verse 1? What's Mark doing that for if he's just a prophet? What's Mark doing uh, saying that Jesus is forgiving sins if he's just a good prophet? No prophet can forgive sins. Only God can do that. Yeah. What's Mark doing putting words in God's mouth like, this is my son, if he's just a good Muslim prophet or, yeah. or, or, a, prophet, or a Jewish prophet? Yeah. What's, what's Mark doing there if he's just a prophet? I think the logical conclusion is, he's the God of the Old Testament, Isaiah 40 verse 3. He's God since he forgives sins. He's, and uh, God clearly portrays him as, as, as divine himself when he says, this is my son. Yeah. This is my I, son, listen to him. I think the other thing I would say in terms of... Um, Christian apolog apologetics at least, is that it can um, initially feel quite uncomfortable for people uh, to, um, so if people uh, consider the premise that Isa from the uh, Quran is Jesus Christ, then I think it can feel very uh, disrespectful or a little bit um, jarring to have to dissuade people from following this character of Isa. Um, because they hold the opinion that he is Jesus. So Muslims will often say to me, but I love Jesus. I, you know, he is, um, he's in the Quran. He's mentioned more than Muhammad, um, but they're actually referring to Isa. So the um, technique or the trick of apologetics, Christian apologetics towards um, Muslims is to separate those two characters because the Christ of the Bible is one of the most well referred to and well referenced uh, characters, beings in history, in the entirety of human history. He has his every word and deed uh, recorded um, also in some of the works that have been taken away from the New Testament. So he has additional uh, references in other literature that Christians hold to be not as authoritative as the Bible. And yet within the Quran, we find him doing things that are just not referenced. Similar to Abraham, who is also very well documented. We now find that Abraham travelled uh, miles away from wherever he actually did travel. He, you know, threw up buildings, uh, moon rocks. I don't really know, you know, the entirety of that story. But the fact that we don't find it referenced in the 
canon is um, testament to the fact that it didn't happen. If it had happened, even for a second, it would be mentioned somewhere and it would be referenced. So I think, yes, yeah, the first thing to do is discriminate between Isa and Jesus Christ. And then once you can uh, persuade, hopefully a Muslim, that this character does not tally up with the Jesus in the Bible, it's much less of a stretch to then show them the deity of Christ, because obviously they're told that um, Isa is merely a prophet from his own words, which is how we know that he's not Christ, because Christ never said that. Exactly. I mean, if you look at simply the, the, the earliest accounts of the life of Christ, which is Matthew, Mark, Luke and John and the epistles, you know, there, there are the New, New Testament scholars like Michael Kruger, he will say that the only four Gospels that take us back to the first century is Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. Yeah. When they when they found uh, when they find Gospels compiled together, because when they actually found some Gospels, um, they never found four Gospels compiled together. That was Matthew, Mark and Thomas or John, exactly. the Gospel yeah. of Peter and the Gospel of Barnabas. It was always Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. So when you look at these earliest records of Jesus's life, you have him forgiving sins. You have him doing things that only God can do, saying only things only God can say. You have him being worshipped in Matthew chapter 14. The disciples literally worship him. And notice there, it's not just simply paying homage or something like that. They are actually worshipping him. Because that Greek word used in Matthew 14 to worship Christ is the same Greek word used in Revelation chapter 11 to worship God. So there's, there's no way around it. Every, Mark, Matthew, Luke and John are all pointing to Jesus' divinity. Yeah. The problem with, we also, the problem with, sorry. We also the problem have with, um, Christ accepting worship or at least not rebuking anybody that worships him. We also exactly. have him uh, having a conversation with Peter in which he asks him, who do you say I am? And when he says, yeah, I exactly. say you are the Christ, the son of God, he says those words didn't come from another human being, they came from God. So therefore mm -hmm. he's affirming it in the strongest possible terms. He had most of the Jews who came into contact with him also uh, wishing to stone him for blasphemy because um, even though he didn't blaspheme because for Christ to say he is God is not blasphemy, it's the truth, rather than if a mere uh, prophet were to say it, for example, then it would surely be blasphemous because obviously they're not God, they're merely a prophet. Yeah, you're 100% you're right, because if any prophet said such a thing, that would be shirk, that would be um, making yourself God. And then the Jews even said to him in, in um, John chapter 10, you being a man, make yourself out to be God. So the Jews absolutely understood what he was trying to say, he was God. But the problem with the, 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 the problem as I see with the Islamic position is that it, it would be like somebody coming a thousand years after Muhammad and saying, we believe in Muhammad, but he's a six foot blonde, blue eyed Swedish hand model. And so that's not, that's not the Muhammad of history. That Muhammad yeah. doesn't exist. So when they say this Jesus come along and said and done all these things, when we look at history, that Jesus doesn't exist. The only Jesus we, we should look to is the Jesus we find in the Gospels. Another clue we have to the fact that Easter bin Mariam is not um, Christ is, for one, his genealogy within the Quran. He is the uh, son, at least, so he has a very similar um, nativity, as it were. He has a miraculous birth within Surah 19. But what he has is a mother who is the, I think, niece of Aaron, um, who is the brother of Moses. So mm -hmm. the, Marian, uh, the Mariam, rather, that that refers to is a good six, seven, eight, I don't know, almost a thousand years prior to uh, the Mary of the Bible. We don't um, hear much about the, uh, the contemporary miracles that he performed as his first miracles. The turning water into wine is obviously haram. Um, we don't hear those things. We hear him speaking from the cradle, as you discussed with Yahya, which is an apocryphal work and has been tweaked somewhat and plagiarized into um, a miracle where his first, literally almost his first words, apart from um, some blessings upon events that will come during his lifetime, are that I am merely a prophet. Whereas if we look at the, uh, the ways in which he blesses himself, he says, blessed is the day I am born. So that's check, that's happened in the Quran. Blessed is the day I die is slightly more problematic for Muslims because he doesn't have a death in the Quran. Um, and blessed is the day I rise again to life. So those three events actually did occur within the Bible. Also, we know that Allah um, rebukes uh, somewhat Isa for, he asks him at least, did you tell them to worship you and your mother alongside me? So there's a misconception of the Trinity, which is unfortunate for Muslims because I think that's where, they, where they're stuck on the Trinity quite often because they assume that Mary 
um, not the niece of Moses, is, uh, yeah, is part yeah, of that. Which, which, which kind of leads us to the conclusion that the author of the Quran didn't understand what the Christians actually believed. Because when you say, like you just said then, um, did you teach your followers to worship um, you and your mother it, it, as partners and me? No Christian has ever worshipped Mary. Uh, yeah. in, in, you know, if, if you worship Mary, that's considered heretical. So if even if you want to say that... Um, especially Quran, not as part of the Trinity. So no, there's the not, accusations no. of people overly venerating Mary, and that's neither Absolutely. here nor there, but never as part of the Trinity, never no, um, no. father, mother and son, or yeah. uh, which, mother, spirit and son. Yeah. It, I've never heard of it. Which, well, no, I, I mean, I, I've, never, I've, never, I've never come across any Christian sect that ever believes Mary was part of the Trinity. No. Um, it, it just doesn't exist. So that's pretty conclusive as well. You know, I think the only way you could come to that conclusion, yeah, the only, the only way you could come to that tree, and of and obviously, obviously they know God, they might see an image of Mary and an image of the baby Jesus, yeah. and they might then conclude, well, Mary's the mother of Jesus. If he's God to Christians, then this must be the Trinity. And also the, kind of, those to see, the artistic license with the halo and the very solemn pose and the kind of um, elevation in terms of uh, positioning within the paintings and stuff like that. I mean, I mean, I mean, c certainly within the early church, there would have also been some icons of a dove re representing the Holy Spirit. Yeah. But what 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 um, seventh century um, Arab is going to look at, uh, especially if they're not familiar with Christianity. Is going to look at an image of a dove and assume that's the Holy Spirit. Well, it's so like asking somebody to look at the image of a lamb and uh, know somehow that that was representing Christ within a yeah, certain. It, 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 exactly. So, so I, I tend to think, and of course we can't absolutely conclu conclusively prove this, but my theory is that when they saw these images, these icons in some churches at the time, like uh, having Mary holding the baby Jesus, we believe Jesus is God. If Mary is his mother and God's his father, therefore that must be the Holy Trinity. Yeah. Okay, so another um, display or confirmation of Christ's divinity, or at least his age, is, um, is found in John, and it's 8.58. So during an exchange between Christ and uh, some Jews who are accusing him, or at least heavily suggesting that he is possessed, he is not who he claims to be. So they're, they're basically fishing for information, and they ask him, they accuse him of being possessed. He says, no, that's not the case. And because of his language, he um, refers to things that he can do. He shows that he's not seeking glory. And yet they ask him again, who do you claim to be? And they're, they're trying to get him to say God, obviously, so they can pick up stones uh, to stone him to death. And what he tells them is, before Abraham was, I am. And in the Greek, ego me, in the Hebrew, Yahweh, that's the name of God. The name which God gave to Moses. So Ben, did you want to elaborate on on that? Really? Yeah, you're right. He, that, that is a name that God um, um, revealed to Moses uh, in, in that sense. Because in Exodus three fourteen, that's when God says to Moses, "Tell Pharaoh, I am has sent you." That's the title there. I am. When Jesus says, "Before Abraham was, I am," yeah. what he's doing there is he's claiming to be the God of Moses. Yeah. which is a clear proof that Jesus is in fact claiming to be God of Moses. Therefore, he's the God of the Jews. Therefore, he's God. Yeah. And the Jews understood this because time and time again, they tried to kill him. I yeah. mean, if you just go to two, two chapters after that, in chapter 10, mm -hmm. he, he once again says things similar to this, like the father is in me. I am in the father. I am the father of one. And then they pick up stones to stone him to death. If he's just claiming to be a prophet, why are they trying to stone him to death? Mm -hmm. They tried to stone him to death for blasphemy. That was the punishment for blasphemy. And to claim to be God is blasphemy if you're just a man. Exactly. So it's a, it's, if you're it's God, a, it's just telling the truth. Because exactly. we know if Christ you, didn't lie. He kept exactly. the laws perfectly. And that's another um, issue uh, that Islam has with him. Because obviously, as you're aware, and hopefully the viewers are by now, uh, Muhammad is put on a pedestal as the best example for mankind. It's pretty easy to disprove, really. I mean, within the Quran, Christ is seen as righteous without sin. Um, so that puts you up quite high, even if you don't want to vouch, say, that that, uh, that individual is, in fact, God. But the fact that Muhammad, at one point in the Quran, and I forget the verse, unfortunately, 
he's told that you are forgiven uh, yesterday and today and for the future. So any sins that he has committed, is committing or will commit, have been forgiven. Whereas Christ never asks for forgiveness for himself. He asks forgiveness for others. He prays for others. He tells others how to pray, which is the job traditionally of God, or at least a very uh, senior rabbi, I imagine, so, which he was. So um, that's another distinction that Christ is sinless. And that's the only way that he could fulfill the atonement and the sacrificial law of Moses that he in fact told us he was going to come to fulfill. And you're you're hundred percent right. It, it took a perfect man to yeah. take the, the sins upon himself because I can't take your sins for you because no. I have my own I have my own sin I have my own baggage. So it took someone who's perfect to take the sins of the world upon himself, which has to be the God man Jesus because he's the only one who lived a perfect life for thirty three something years. We couldn't live for thirty three something seconds. Perfect. And yeah. it's only in the Christ it's only in the Christian faith where you have two of these attributes of God, his mercy and his justice, are both kept without contradiction. Perfect. Because, at, yeah. because at, the at, at the cross is where God's justice and mercy kiss. Yes. God's justice is done because sin was in fact punished in Christ, but God's mercy is also shown that in Christ all can have eternal life. Now, so it's the full circle saying, from the sins of Adam all the way up to the atonement of Christ. So mm -hmm. sin enters through one man, we are told, and that is Adam, at the fall um, and because of that sin and because of the subsequent curse that God places on the earth and on mankind uh, Christ comes to redeem um, you know to take away the wages of sin which is death you don't opt into it you can't opt out of it it is in fact um, for all mankind not just Christians it's not only Christians don't believe that they are separated by this curse um, of to Adam it's in fact meted out upon everybody and only those who repent through the blood of Christ uh, will have a claim to salvation because, as we know, some will claim it and Christ will tell them, I never knew you. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And, and it, like I said, it's only in the Christian faith do we have a just God and a merciful God. Amen. Now, uh, so, I mean, I've spoke to some Muslims who, um, there's one Muslim gentleman who said, you don't have a just God because he punishes a sin for, our, uh, he punishes a perfect individual for the, for the crime of sinners. I, I, I'm so I, I, sorry I said, to interrupt. You can tell me what you said, but I'm just going to point out that there's a hadith where Allah will remove a mountain of sin from a Muslim and place them onto a Jew or a Christian or both, depending on the size of the mountain. Sorry to interrupt. Carry yeah, on. That's fine. Absolutely. So I said, actually, I think in Christianity, we have a God who's both just and merciful. In Islam, you have a God who you can say he's merciful because he forgives sins. You kind of, you know, you say sorry and you, he, you're forgiven. But you don't have a just God because he doesn't punish the sin. Yeah. Because I mean, if you, I mean, let's try this in the court of law. If you say in the court of law, judge, I'm very sorry um, for what I've done. Please forgive me. And the judge says, yeah, that's fine. Just go. As as the Islamic concept is it's merciful, that, that, it's not just. That that judge is not just. Yeah. So if you were to go to a judging in a court of law, the judge would in fact punish you for your crime. Yeah. So I would say, is there therefore the earthly judge is more uh, just than the Islamic concept of God? Yeah. When in Christianity, whereas, you have a whereas Christ Christianity, pays, pays the fine for us. Yeah, exactly that. The, 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 the Bible says all will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. That's in Corinthians. So what we have in Christianity is, I mean, imagine you're in that same court of law and you have your, your you know, you're about to get a book thrown at you. You're about to get a fine. You cannot pay. You're about to be sentenced. Imagine then somebody bursting through the door and saying, judge, I'll pay that fine because I love this individual. The judge can illegally set you free, but there's a problem with that because according to the Bible, God is the judge. So what we have in Christianity, we have God who is the judge. Imagine you're in that same court of law. It's then the judge who stands up, takes off his judge's robe, comes down to your level and says, I will pay your fine so that you yeah. can go free. That's what we have in so Christianity. So advocate and judge at the same time. That's what we have in Christianity. No other world religion has that form of justice and mercy. Amen. Come to Christ. Anybody who's yes. listening, have a look into it. Right, so in, um, in conclusion, I guess, because I think we're almost out of time, um, uh, what would be your uh, suggestions for people? Obviously, at the moment, uh, within the UK, we can't go to Speaker's Corner. Um, how would you, I mean, how do you keep up your practicing? I know um, you're pretty much an expert in uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, and I'm sure they're loving life at the moment because everybody's at home. 
but do they ever visit? I mean, do do you think they have your address maybe on a? No, they they, they knocked once on my door. <laughs> since I've got I've got a big X on my door, so. Okay. Yeah, right. Well, so what would you suggest people do who are interested in apologetics or polemics, um, you know, apart from subscribing to your channel, which of course is Bible Outreach, or, you know, are there any apologists um, or polemicists who you enjoy listening to or reading or watching on YouTube that you might be able to uh, suggest for people watching? Um, yeah, I mean, book wise, I would recommend, um, especially in this time when we're locked down, because you can't really go anywhere and do anything. So you, You've kind of got no excuse. You've got the perfect ample amount of time to to digest some books. So I, I would recommend a really good book by um, David Wilhite, um, which is the Gospel According to Heretics, which speaks about um, the Islamic view of Christ, the uh, modalistic, the Sabellianism, the um, uh, Marcia, Marcionism, and all these other her her heresies, which we do see a lot at Speakers Corner. So if you are someone to go to Speakers Corner. That's a good book to buy. Um, okay. you know, uh, I suggest, all right, so I'm going to take a turn and then you can finish off your suggestions. I would suggest YouTube wise, uh, listening to maybe Sam Shamoon for uh, biblical um, teachings and disseminations, uh, Acts 17 Apologetics for ever so slightly sassier um, explanations of some of the Surah and Hadith. Um, Jay Smith, of course, at Fanda Films is an excellent resource for all things Islamic, um, Sira International, DCCI also, Soko Films goes without saying. Um, yeah, anything else, Ben? Any more people who are. If, oh, I'm you, sorry, Rob Christian also. Oh, okay. Christian Prince. You, you, you mentioned um, Jehovah's Witnesses, a, a really good um, apologist many years ago. See, a lot of the apologists I like of. of long been dead um search someone called walter martin dr walter I've martin yeah yeah he, he's um he was he was he wrote a book the uh the kingdom and the cults mm -hmm. and um he's really good with jehovah's witnesses and mormons uh but the baha'i religion um you know the wickers if you're into that kind of thing i would definitely recommend uh, walter martin and his his material on that kind of thing really good brilliant all right i'll try if i can I'll try to post some links to some resources uh, <laughs> in the description box if I have, yeah, if I've got enough space in the description box. But um, most of the channels that I mentioned, you literally type that into the search bar and away you go. So on that, I'll wrap up and say God bless to everybody listening, everybody who watches this in the future, to you as well, Ben. Um, remind you one more time to just subscribe even to Ben's channel, which is Bible Outreach. And yeah, we'll be back again soon. Um, if you also, apart from, I don't mean to sound rude, but apart from copy and pasted questions, which are repeated ad nauseum, if you have any questions that you'd like me to speak to Ben about, or you'd like Ben to ask me, or something of that description, you pop those in the comment box and I'll be sure to ask them at some time in the future. Um, ben, over to you for your goodbyes. Yeah, thanks a lot. Take care. <laughs> Short and to the point. All right, sure, take good. care, everybody, and Thank God you. bless. And um, yeah, just turn from Islam and come to All right, God bless everybody.